Welcome to the All Things Wildfire podcast, where we delve into the latest trends and hot topics in protecting properties against wildfire. So sit back, relax, and join us as we arm you against disaster. Guys, so welcome back to another episode of All Things Wildfire. Uh, this is your host, O.P. Almaraz, and today I have a very special guest. Uh, to me, he's special, even though I've known him for... Uh, probably a year now, over a year, yeah, over a year yeah. Mr. Rich Snyder. And, and I'm going to, guys, I'm going to fire away just a ton of questions that I think you listeners will want to know because I was very intrigued in wanting to know when the firefighting team is out on a strike force and they're trying to get and take care of um, homes that are, while you're going through a wildfire, what are the firemen thinking? What's the process? What are the procedures? And so that's what I want to dive into. Um, it's going to, I think, really give all of us a better understanding as to what the firefighters are up against when they go out like that. So, uh, Rich, I'll let you introduce yourself briefly. Go for it. Briefly? That's what I'm to do. <laughs> Sorry, you know bud. Me, you've known me long enough that briefly is yeah. yeah, my name is Rich Snyder. I was 36 years in the fire service, 20, 25 as a fire marshal, as an engine captain, a station captain. So I had my own crew and at the station and as a wildland engine boss, going out to the wildfires throughout the state of California for the Office of Emergency Services. And yeah, a lot of experience. And awesome. uh, yeah, a long time out there. Guys, l let me dive in. So, so Rich, I know uh, when we met, I knew, hey, this guy is the founder of using long-term fire retardant um, at, a, at a fire station. Right, that, that's yeah. very uncommon, not known of too much, right? Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so we started doing that at the Rose Bowl back okay. in uh, 1990. Um, and it came out of an experiment in the late 80s from the Forest Service. They were experimenting on taking the FOS check that comes out of the planes yeah. and trying to get it into helicopters. So they came up with this vehicle that would mix it and then take it to a heliport that can put it in helicopters and faster with a much faster turnaround time than okay. an airplane. Um, but the logistics of getting the FOS check to a heliport just didn't work out and they kind of abandoned the, the project. But Pasadena with the America Fest fireworks show, they were having trouble with fireworks that were set off in the Arroyo Seco during the 4th of July. And this so, is the fireworks from other people? From other people bringing their own. Got it, got right. it, okay. And so they did an experiment and said, hey, we've got this truck. If America Fest wants to pay for the FOS check, we can protect the community. Got it. So they did that for two years, and then they got rid of the, the truck because of reasons that the Forest Service just were downsizing their water tenders. And my department bought that water tender for a dollar and with the agreement that we would use it for the Rose Bowl <laughs> for FOS legit. check. Okay. So I was FOS, FOS what? No, actually, I knew what FOS check was. Okay. So I learned how to do that. and. It wasn't very organized, so we got to get this thing organized. So we put the maps together, uh, put a real scientific method to what we were doing, and I've been doing that for 30 plus years. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, so you guys would go in there pre Fourth of July, spray the perimeter of all the vegetation with fire retardant and coating the vegetation in case there was an ignition it wouldn't take off it would ignite then turn itself off yeah the fire won't won't go. and we've got documented cases around the royal um where fireworks little fires got started and they never went anywhere um we also that same weekend it's usually the weekend before the fourth of july we also treat santa anita canyon road okay. which is goes up to chanty flats in the national forest and it's a single lane or single road three and a half miles long, it's mid-slope, and at the end, you've got thousands of people, but this big hazard in between. So right. we would we would FOS check the road to give people a chance to get got out it. if there was a fire, to make a wider evacuation route. And I've got a documented case of a vehicle fire that happened in September. We applied this late June, early July, just before the 4th, and in late September, we had a vehicle fire, got right up next to the brush, was burning into the brush, and the brush never took took off. Boom. And the engine company was amazed. The engine company, that's the, the firefighters yeah. and the fire. They were amazed. And I came out for the uh, fire investigation and they were, they were saying what a good job they did and how incredible. And I looked at it and went, well, yeah, it was the FOS check. We had already sprayed but this. But if you're feeling good about it, go for it. You yeah. know? So yeah. it was it was interesting to see it to see FOS check in action. That's that awesome. was that was two months later. Awesome. Yeah. Now one more thing about long-term fire retardant FOS check. We've actually sprayed it. So we've actually sprayed it at, at uh, a park, 
which was near um, a homeless encampment. Yeah. And so a few months later, it was on video, someone caught a homeless person trying to ignite the vegetable. Oh. So this gentleman tried to ignite it. Someone caught him on video and they're trying to stop him. He ignited a couple, of, well, I think one area for sure, and it, it started to burn about two feet and then it turned itself off. Yep. And I want to share with the listeners, and this is not really the topic that I want to talk about, but I'll share with you, like, this is key, like, for for fire marshals, for other communities, for, for evacuation, for homeless encampment areas that are uh, really suspect or can be an ignitable area. Long-term fire retardant on vegetation is an option, absolutely. And so... I'm working with, with this, another city who approached us about... Um, some of their infrastructure. You know, during the Kenaloa fire mm -hmm. in 93, they had all the water, went, the water system went out and they had no water in the fire hydrants and they lost 250 homes, actually more than that. And they didn't have water because the water system, the reservoirs are up on the hillside yeah. and the fire took out the power and they had no way to oh, pump. Oh, shoot. And so you've got water, you've got communication towers that are set up on hills so they can get better communication. So there's a lot of infrastructure that, that government you know, uh, cities could and use some help with. could use some help with, yeah. you know, protect that, protect those water systems, the electrical systems, the, the sewer systems, the treatment plants, uh, com telecommunications. Yeah. So, so important. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, guys, send us an email, let us know. Now, I want to get into what I really wanted to talk about, Rich, is I find it very intriguing. I was evacuated in 2020. Okay. Blue Ridge Fire, uh, you know, the it wasn't a mandatory evacuation at the time. I just, I could see the hillside over the hill, like glowing at night. And, and I could see the fire trucks coming in our area. I'm like, hey, babe, we got to go. So I, I, I took my nephew, my uh, mother-in-law, my two dogs, my wife, and I said, we're out of here. The next day, it was mandatory, okay? But it was interesting because... No one knew what the heck was going on. Like no one's ever saying, hey guys, you know, this block is okay. When you try to go back, everything's shut down. So there's no information, but learning about what you're thinking as a firefighter when you're dispatched to one of these events, man, it's, it's really sad. That was really sad right there, honestly. So it's really sad to know that, hey man, my house may not make it. And it really largely is up to you guys. Like, what, what decision making do you guys go through? Like, that's it, key it's for tough. me. Like, what, what happens? It is. It's tough. You know, we get out there, and you know, a lot of people think, you know, I'm good because the fire department's going to be there. Right. There's not enough firefighters, enough fire engines in the state of California to attack a fire. You know, a typical house fire is going to take you know, 15 firefighters at a minimum, and engine companies. So okay, so that was news to me. Like. So that's your standard operating that procedure. Would, that would just a house, just a standard house fire, you know. Okay, fifteen firefighters. At a minimum, fifteen. Okay. I mean, you, usually it's like twenty. I think the NFPA says twenty-seven or something. But you need, you know, crews to do that. And we don't have that, you know. In a wildfire, none of the homes. Hopefully, none of the homes are burning yet. But I pulled it in a cul-de-sac, and a strike team is five engines and a battalion chief. Okay. So, and we're assigned to an area, and depending on how big the area and the number of resources, but you know, you'll get a, a cul-de-sac, okay, my engine will have this cul-de-sac, and I'll pull in and I'll have five, six, nine homes, and we look at it and it's just three of us on a fire engine and nine houses. Oh. Which one we're gonna save? And, or, or which one is the, I wanna say which one we're gonna save, that's not the right way to say it. Yeah, so which, what, what which is the thinking? Ones, what's the questioning that's going so on we there? Wanna, we wanna see which ones are gonna survive this fire. It's gonna have the best chance of surviving. And you know, if you go in and you see one home that hasn't done vegetation and they're really threatened, you'd think that one's really threatened, we better focus on that one. And if we focus all of our energy on one, we might lose the other nine. And so we have to really, tr what we call, tr we do structure triage. Okay. We'll break up, each guy will go to a house, Go to, and I'm gonna run that house, I'm gonna pull things away from the house, I'm gonna read the fuels, I'm gonna read the topography, I'm gonna look at the, the building construction. Is this thing gonna survive if I'm not here? If not, okay, I need to put a hose line over here. Okay, that's an option. And then we're gonna do that to all of them. 
and we got to put a plan together and figure out which ones are we gonna, where are we gonna where are we gonna make a stand on this fire? So so you're gonna make a stand somewhere. Yeah. Right. You. Well, yeah, that's our plan. However, I've been in many cases where we go in and based on topography, fuels, and the weather and yeah. everything that's going on, there's no, we're gonna make sure no one's there. And just get out. I'm gonna take a picture of every oh, house, man. and we got and it's heartbreaking, absolutely heart wrenching. Uh, last summer, I was at, on a fire up in uh, Middle California at the Sequoias, and we pulled in and we had 12 homes. And I looked at these homes. One of them I thought was going to do okay, and it actually did. It was the only one that survived. Okay. But from the time of looking at these homes to when the fire hit was about 18, 18 minutes, which is a close call. But I could tell you, I distinctly remember going up to one home, and it was beautiful. I think there were there were vacation homes, I think, but it was like a log cabin. And I looked in the window, and I could see, you know, the pictures and just this beautiful mountain retreat. It was gorgeous. And I looked on the kitchen counter, and there was a half-eaten banana that wasn't rotten. In other words, these people in the morning, Boom. in the middle of my left. breath, hey, you got to get out, set the banana down, and left. And I sat there thinking, there's nothing I can do for these people. Absolutely nothing because of the, the condition or the topography there. And I was the last person to see Ooh. that house and the pictures. And I have it in my mind today. I can remember the pictures on the and, and going. Wow. It's just tragic. Wow. And we came back in and all the homes were gone. Except, except for the one. Except for the one that we looked at and went, this one's a winner. See, that, that that's what I want to focus on, Rich, because it's like the more people need to realize that when there is a wildfire, yes, we pay our taxes. Yes, we expect law enforcement and the firefighters to do what they have to do. There's just not enough, mm. okay? And so now, if, if you're gonna be coming into my neighborhood, I wanna know what do I have to do to have you look at it and go, yep, that's the house, we're gonna stand and we're gonna protect this, versus, hey man, let me get some photos because that house is not gonna make it. Like, that's, to me, it's, it's tragic to know that happens, but I, I think more people need to realize this is reality. And so if firefighters are going in there looking at your home, at my home, they're having to make these decisions. And so Rich, let me just back it up a little bit. When you're looking at a community, let's just say one block, what turns you off right away? Like meaning like, hey, that one's, don't, let's not waste our time there, guys, because that house, uh, it's going to take us too much work to try and prep it. What is it that stands out in your mind for you? Um, so one of the things we look at is, you know, the easiest to do and, is, and the most obvious is the vegetation management. Okay. If I got brush right up against the house, I don't have time to cut down the brush. You got, you got trees overhanging yeah. the, the and, roof. And, and it's not as simple in a wildfire that we, the water hose that we use. Yeah. We're not necessarily putting water on the fire because it's just too much heat. We're using that for mop up or maybe to do some prep work, but direct firefighting very rarely involves a fire hose on the flames. Okay, this is so, huge, hold on. Yeah. Like, I think this needs to be reemphasized. I'm gonna say it the way I heard it, okay? Is you can, when you're going out there as a firefighter and you have your hoses, you're not putting water on the fire. You're not fighting the fire because it's too extreme and the water that you have is not going to help because the, the BTUs and the heat is too strong. Is that what It just turns saying? it to steam, yeah. Okay, so you're going in there, you're saying, what home can we triage and, and then maybe defend if you need to, uh, but triage and get out. So you're not there to fight the fire. Not necessarily, no. Okay. Uh, you know, if, if it's gonna be low intensity flames, okay, maybe I can hit the, hit the, 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 the grasses or something with some water at the last minute. Yeah. Or is, it, is it a place that I could, that if the fire comes through, am I gonna survive? So, right. you, know, we, we, you know, lives are the first Of course, priority. of course, of course. And so a firefighters, we're not gonna go into an area where our life is gonna get risk over so someone doesn't have to make an insurance claim. Right. Okay. The, that's not even in your the, mind. The, like, the, the amount of money on your insurance is not nearly enough to cover my life. Right. And right. so we have to look at it that way. And it's actually a lot easier to do when firefighters go to other cities 
and fight fire oh. than in your own community. Man, I, I've in heard. my own community, I'm looking at, it's not just someone's house, that's Mrs. Smith's house. And I'm gonna do what I can for her. And it's hard for firefighters. It's, I tell you, it is hard for firefighters to look at houses and say, yeah, that's a goner. We hate it. It's heart wrenching. Mm. We would like to save them all. And it's not a matter of more firefighters. There's, the way this works is you couldn't produce enough firefighters. Right. So the, the answer is to try to prevent that home from burning without the fire department. Mm. And it can be done. There's things you can do so that home will survive without the fire department. And it's one thing if a fire starts a mile away and you know firefighters can get in there and do some prep work and you know try to save it. What if the fire starts next door? And the fire burns before the fire department even, is even notified. Right. You may lose your house before the right. fire department even knows it's happening. Got it. So our goal is to have the house in a condition that if there is a fire, the flame intensity is going to be low enough. Your home is hardened. It's not going to, the embers aren't going to get to it. The radiant heat's not going to get to it. Fire's not going to come to the home. Let the fire burn around it. Boom. We can't prevent these fires. Got we it. can't stop these fires. Got it. So but we it, can protect the homes. In, in wrapping up this this podcast, um, let's give the homeowners, the listeners, some takeaways. And so, based on what you just said, I'm gonna I'm gonna start the list, and then please add yeah. to it. Okay. So number one is manage the vegetation. Like some of the obvious things are, if you have trees that are up against the roof, those branches, if 100% have got to be trimmed off. And we gotta have at least five feet, is that what you're gonna say? At least five feet of no vegetation around the home. On the ground, yeah. On the ground, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, and so that prevents the flames from coming to the home. Because a lot of what's happening, it sounds like we're bringing the flames to our house, to our front door, yeah. Yeah. right? And so by keeping the vegetation five feet away from the home, keeping branches away from the roof line at least 10 feet, right? Um, what else? Can so it do? depends on the, on the vegetation, but there's okay. three ways that fire's gonna hit it. Got it. Fire burning to the house. Okay. So you want that zero to five from the house. So even a small flame's not gonna set your house on fire. Got it. Okay. Then you've got the radiant heat. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a lot of brush that's, you know, five feet may not be enough. It needs to be 30 feet, 60 feet, 100 feet if you've got larger, because you don't want the radiant heat to set the house on fire. Got it, got it. And that third one is the embers getting to your house and getting into your house or starting small fires next to your house. Those are the three things to address. Got it. So we got to keep the flame. We don't want to bring the fire to our home. The flames, zero to five, prevent the, the small flames or flames getting up next to the house. Non-negotiable. I don't care if you got bougainvilleas from grandma, that's coming out. Yeah, zero to five. Done. And, and up to 30 feet, you want things low growth. At 30 feet, you want things that are like 18 inches. Got it. So if it does burn, because like I said, it's going to burn. Question is, when it burns, is it going to produce the energy that's going to set the house on fire? Got it. So okay. within that first 30 feet, you want low growth, hardly you know, down low to the ground, and you want things spaced out. Got it. So that's vegetation. Now, yep. we know that embers can fly for miles. Yep. So even if the flames are not at our door, the embers are attacking the neighborhood. And so, what are you recommending there? So. It, it, like you said, it, it'll go for miles. It's not very, it, most of the homes lost, 90% are from embers. It's not a tsunami wall of fire that takes out the house. Right. It's a small fire that starts next to the house or in the house that gets it going. So the embers hit your house, that zero to five. Anything within that first five feet of the house, you don't want mulch, you don't want grass, you want rock, gravel, concrete, zero combustion within that five feet. Got it. Okay. Um, then you've got vents, you know, venting of the house. If they're through the foundation vents, the roof vents, eave vents, gable vents, embers will suck into that vent mm -hmm. and start the inside of the house on fire. We saw on the, the Laguna, coastal fire, yeah, yeah. The coastal fire, we had what, 20 something homes that were going and none of them, all of them were burning from the top down, inside out, from the attics, without the vegetation burning on the property. Yeah. And it was just because the embers went inside and set the house on fire. And once it starts, it's done. 
that house is done. Because again, we don't have the resources to fight an uh, individual house. If we get to an area and a house is already burning, <laughs> rarely, unless it's, unless it's something we can get to quick on the outside, if the house, if it's gotten into the house, I don't have the equipment or the manpower to fight a house fire it's during a wildfire. Down. That one's done. Got it. Let's try to protect the next one. Got it. So as far as embers, we're, we're uh, installing eighth inch uh, bushfire mesh or ember resistant vents. Correct. Uh, we're installing gutter guards. Yep. Also. Yes. Um, and then we have zero to five on the vegetation. Yes. Uh, as far as the, the, the building materials of the home, look, I, I hear a lot of people saying like, you gotta have class A fire rate or roof, which I think in California, the code is, is pretty prominent. That's, you have to do that. But people still have combustible siding on yeah. the house. Yeah, they do. Like, I see that as a big problem. Like, how is that? Like, people have to make a huge investment. To so homes built today in the Cal under the California code, what we call CBC 7A, they're, they're well protected. Okay. Um, we've got that into the code for non-combustible siding, dual pane tempered glass, class A roof, uh, vents, all this is being addressed in the code. And we know it works because we've seen it work mm -hmm. in fires. The problem is, is in, until everyone replaces their house in California, 99.9% .9 of the infrastructure out there is old construction. Yep. So we need to go back in and retrofit. And the government, we can't, you know, re force someone to retrofit their house. So it's up to the homeowner to take that action. Got it. To bring their house into, uh, into uh, not really compliance because there's no code, but you want to bring your house to align with the science where the fire is not going to attack that house. Got it. And I, I think in closing here, Rich, the, the takeaways, the tools that, that we can give to listeners is, Number one, you, you, you likely need to get a wildfire assessment on your property. Have an expert go in there and, and a, a, a wildland expert, preferably, who understands wildfire behavior, wildfire science to create an assessment, right? Correct. From there, they're gonna tell you, hey, here are the vulnerabilities for your property. Here's what needs to happen because it's specific to each property. It's not just general, like, like you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And so it's vegetation management, it's ember resistant vents and protect yourself from, from embers in addition to the gutter guards. Uh, and it's class A fire rated building materials. So that's a lot to take in for a homeowner, uh, but getting an assessment is gonna break down all the different details that you need to be able to take action and understand what investment you're gonna need to make to protect your home because as much as we don't have enough firefighters, we also likely don't have enough insurance on our policies, brother. Like that's that's what's crazy. It's coming down the pipe. It continues to change every single day. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing on the assessment we look at, we're looking at topography, and that's that, that's that where it's important that the person who does the assessment needs to have that wildland experience, and the the assessment needs to be done from someone who's looking at it on the science based on a science not based on a product. And we've seen oh, that. We've seen that. We've so seen true. where yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. We, we sell this widget, so based on our widget, you should do this. Um. Ally, our guys don't look at widgets. <laughs> they look at the science. And many times we've gone out and someone has, we've gotten there and said, hey, you need to do this. Well, that was a rose bush that grandma planted 80. We're not getting rid of that. I said, okay, we're just telling you you got, should get rid of it. You, you didn't have us come out to tell us what you want to hear. Yes. You have us out so we could tell you what needs to be. You can make that decision what you want to do. Got it. But we're out here to tell you this, based on science, is the problem. Boom. Yeah. And, and to wrap this up, I, I think one, one other thing that comes to mind is that we've had people say, hey, all I want is FOSS check. And yeah. we are like, don't need it. No. Right? Yeah. Hey, you don't, you, you need to do vent protection. Yeah, I remember that gentleman. He was really surprised oh. that he called us out for that. And I said, no, you don't need it. He said, wait a minute. That's why I called you. Yeah. Um, because again, we're looking at it based on the science. And it's not a single, Fostrick's not the answer. Vents aren't the answer. Yes. Gutter guards aren't the answer. Vegetation, it has to go, it's a holistic approach. Boom. One of those things. There's no magic bullet that's going to solve the problem. Agreed. It's 
vegetation management. It's all those components of, of home hardening. It's FOSCheck. It's all of that together based on the science, based on the topography of what your best way for structural survivability in a fire. Boom. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you very much, uh, you all listeners, for listening in. Listening in. Uh, you know, the, the biggest takeaway, in addition to how to protect our homes, is really the realization that, man, the firefighters are doing the best they possibly can. They're limited. They have to make decisions on the spot. And wow, like, what can we do to improve our home? Not only to make it more insurable to insurance companies, but how can we make it more attractive to a firefighter where he or she says, Boom, we're saving that house because they've done the work and we can tell. So that's all we got for today, guys. If you, uh, if you enjoyed the, the podcast, leave us some notes. God bless. Peace out. That's all for this episode of All Things Wildfire. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to our show and follow us on social media to stay up to date on All Things Wildfire. And as always, thanks for listening.